All my stuff is gone. Look, come on, please. We got money for this, all right? Come the f down. Calm down? Yes, calm down, all right? I'm gonna say this. There are few words or phrases that I could hear in an argument and know this thing is about to go from two, three to 10 more than when I hear calm down. You tell somebody to calm down, they're not gonna be calm. <laughs> Let's just leave it at that. If you can try to take that phrase out of your repertoire for arguing because more than likely it's going to ramp them up even more. Hey GQ, I'm Stephanie Yates Anyabwile. Welcome back to part two. We'll be watching more scenes of couples fighting. This is The Breakdown. First up, Schitt's Creek. Rachel and I were engaged, but I called it off before I moved here. Okay, you know what? You don't need to explain yourself. The unique thing about this clip is talking about being on different places in your journey with, you know, how open you are with your community or your family about who you feel you truly are. And this could be religion, this could be veganism. I've seen it where you could have a person who eats meat but won't eat it in front of their family member because everybody else is vegan. We got together when we were in high school and we, we've been on and off ever since. Uh, I don't know, we always just sort of fell back into it. Anyway, she's been uh, reaching out and expecting us to get back together for the past few months. Mm, whoa. It's not a question of should he be willing to wait or should he just come out to his family? That's not the question. The question is in the context of this relationship, which sacrifice feels the most in line with your ultimate goals for your future? Is it more important to you to be with this specific person? Or is it more important to you to be in a relationship where you can shot it from the mountaintops and be public about everything? You stood in front of me and told me to trust people. I know. When I was perfectly fine not trusting people. Not trusting people is what I'm used to. It is my comfort zone. So when it comes to a person with trust issues, which let's face it, most of us come with some degree of issues with trusting other people because we've been hurt in the past and we harp on that so that we can protect ourselves in the future. But ultimately, learning how to trust again, that's your responsibility. A person cannot make you trust again. They can help you in your own journey by communicating and finding out the things that help build trust in these specific relationships. It's your responsibility to first recognize you have them, then think about what you need to do and why you have those trust issues, maybe work it out in therapy. And thirdly, be sure to communicate to your partner things that could help them help you as you try to become more trusting. No matter how hard I tried with her, it just never felt right. And up until recently, I didn't understand why. You make me feel right, David. That is quite possibly one of the most beautiful things I've ever heard anyone say. Typically, when we're in arguments, we don't even want to give our partners the benefit of the doubt or compliment them. So in that moment, I thought they did a great job of providing one another with safety, like a safe space and security and saying, I'm going to be open about how I feel. And they both seem to take that cautiously. They didn't throw it in each other's face. This has really messed things up for me. And I think I need some time with it. All right. Asking for patience is definitely something you can try with your partner, but it ultimately it is up to them what their own personal limits are. If a person feels like they've been in this situation before and it didn't pan out well with being patient, then you have to respect that they are using their own experience to guide their decision about whether or not to grant you that. So it's totally fine to ask for patience, but be prepared for either answer. Next up, Big Little Lies. Why is it still here? <laughs> Funny you should ask. I sold it all today. Oh. To Ted Farrell. Nice. Well, and the best Celeste. part is, we get to keep it all. A couple of things. You can see he's enjoying making her upset. When I'm seeing that stuff in a couple session, my hope <laughs> that they're going to be able to work on the relationship and get better 
it goes down. If you actually enjoy making your partner upset or hurting them, that is sadistic, right? All my stuff is gone. Look, come on, please. We got money for this, all right? Come the f down. Calm down? Yes, calm down, all right? I'm gonna say this. There are few words or phrases that I could hear in an argument and know this thing is about to go from two, three to 10, more than when I hear calm down. You tell somebody to calm down, they're not gonna be calm. <laughs> Let's just leave it at that. If you can try to take that phrase out of your repertoire for arguing because more than likely it's going to ramp them up even more. You lost all our money. Yeah. And all the while, you've been the nanny. Well, now she's gone, I need something to play with, don't I? By the way, I hate this scene because there is absolutely nothing productive to even point out in the conversation. He's egging her on, he wants her to get upset, and she sees that. So you see that moment where she's like, how can I hurt him the way that he's hurting me? And she recognizes that he values these toys more than he does her, so she's trying to affect him. She wants him to hurt like she's hurting. You know, I would never say this to a couple, but guys, honestly, can you blame her? We all know that money is one of the top reasons that couples not only fight, but get divorced. With money, whenever you're going into a marriage, you want to be very clear about expectations, about spending habits, about how much both of you make. You wanna be clear about your future goals with money. Is retirement important to you? Are you a live in the moment kind of person? We don't really like to think about those things. Sometimes we're at the beginning of a relationship because we don't wanna ruin and all of the good feelings that we're having. We don't wanna have an awkward conversation. We think our love can conquer all, but money is just one of those things that love can rarely just conquer. So you need to plan, you need to strategize. And what we're seeing here is that he's keeping secrets. When you start purposefully leaving your partner out of that decision, it grows. You're like, well, I didn't tell him about this. I don't need to tell him about this. And the next thing you know, you guys are leading two completely separate lives. It's it's really important that you clue your partner in, even if you all don't have a joint bank account and you have your money separate. Ultimately, if you're living together, if you have kids together, it doesn't matter what bank accounts you have it in, your finances affect their finances. This clip really shows how once you have all of these lies and secrets in a relationship, ultimately, you start viewing things, this is my stuff, this is your stuff. We wanna hold on to our individual identities in a relationship. You don't want your whole identity to be based on this relationship, but you want to view things in a partnership as ours. You wanna see things from the we perspective. Why else would you marry that person, right? Things need to be viewed more so as a partnership and you need to have shared purpose for your resources if you want the best chance for your relationship to work. Some people are really looking to get married because they want to have that status of being a wife or being a husband or being a mom. And when you get married for those reasons, a lot of times anything outside of that core of why you got married feels like it's not your partner's business. And so it's really important that even if you did get married for one of those reasons, they are at least clued in as to what you're doing. Because absolutely, people get married for all different kinds of reasons, but that does and excuse secrecy, deception, and lies. Next up, Ozark. Can you access some feeling words? I'm scared. I'm terrified, actually. Let's pause. A couple of things. The reason I love this scene is because there is a couples therapist in it, and I feel for her. Do you think we're safe? I do think that we're safe. You want to help me out here, Sue? Yeah, that'd be great. Can you explain to her that everything that I do is for the family? Oh, and can you explain to him that that is complete bullshit? We see very early on, this is an argument about safety. And I do want to comment a little bit too on when the therapist asks them to use feeling words. That's a way of making sure they use the I position. This is how I feel. And even though she did say it very strong, I'm scared. That's right, that is a feeling word. I'm scared and I'm actually terrified. At this point, they're still communicating fairly well. What does it say about a marriage 
when a husband and wife both try to bribe the therapist, you're both paying me off. The funny thing is she says, when you both try to bribe the therapist, but then follows it up by saying, you're both paying me off. So no, they are bribing you. You're accepting the money, which is completely unethical. She could lose her license. Absolutely do not accept any bribes from your couples. It seems like they're trying to pull her to say that each of them is right and the other is wrong. Because I was worried when you came back with that crazy idea and, and I wanted Sue to work a little harder. You people don't make it easy for anybody. Just shut the f up, Sue. I've had couples try to be condescending, but no, as far as somebody just cursing me out and saying, you know, shut the F up, I have boundaries as well, and I cannot tell my clients to have boundaries if I don't have my own and enforce them too. What is wrong with you? Do you get how dangerous that I'm is? listening to my calls. You wanna know what happened to the maid that lost the teeth? You're jealous. He killed her. You're jealous, that's what this is about because you can't keep up with me. You're no, you, you, can't, you can't. See, this is where we see that the argument is becoming unproductive because it went from I'm scared, I'm terrified, him saying I'm trying to provide you with safety, to now you're trying to tell each other how the other feels. When we start doing that, you're not even trying to learn how they feel. So you both have already lost the argument when you walk away and you don't know anything new about your partner's perspective. I only did what I did because you didn't have the balls to do it yourself. No, I was busy trying to get us the f out. They would have found us. They have two different approaches to what safety looks like. Her idea is let's lean in more and do more of what they want so we can have a future. His idea is let's get out. You know, and they both are not in agreement. So if I was their therapist, I would say, it seems like we have a reoccurring theme where it comes to you both wanting to provide your family and each other with safety, but you have two different strategies for accomplishing that. And let's talk about it in that way because there may be some compromise or a way to understand each other's perspective if they see that ultimately they both had the same end goal. I am trying to build a future for our family out of the mess that you created. And you're, you're just, you're, you're too narrow-minded and jealous to see it. Right, yeah, and you're just a fucking scary, selfish, power-hungry fucking bitch. I will say as far as how I am in couples therapy, I would have been a bit more active in de-escalating them because to me, the difference between having an argument in session versus having an argument in real life is that you have that third person there to make you stop and be a bit more reflective about what it is that you're doing and how you're communicating with each other. So I thought there were some good opportunities in there to make them pause and expand a little bit more instead of just pulling out a bunch of weapons, telling each other how the other feels. Those were some opportunities for her to kind of stop that dynamic in its track. Next up, my cousin Vinny. I am in the dark here with all this legal crap. I have no idea what's going on. All I know is you're screwing up and I can't help. A lot of times in a relationship, especially if our exclusive or primary identity is built in our relationship to that person, when we feel like we can't help them, that could make us feel useless. So I think this whole film, if you watch it, she's actually very, very helpful to him, but she doesn't feel like she's helping. And so when she gets into that headspace, she's really distressed and it makes her start thinking about their future. My biological clock is ticking like this and the way this case is going, I ain't never getting married. Lisa, I don't need this. I think that it's easy to look at this as a woman having a frivolous goal of getting married and he's trying to focus on his career. But if you think about it socially, women are taught a lot of times that our value is tied to marriage, it's tied to children. And she's basically an out of work hairdresser. So her entire identity at this point is tied up in this relationship, which is not good in and of itself but it is. And so I absolutely think it's fair for her to say, I am putting a lot of things on hold in order to keep myself available to you for marriage. So absolutely, she has a right to be frustrated with that timeline that seems to keep getting pushed out further and further. I got a judge that's just aching to throw me in jail. I ain't slept in five days. It's very important to talk about the biological or physical impact 
that our bodies have on our mood. He's saying, I haven't slept in five days, I'm hungry, right? All of these things we need to think about when we are about to get into an argument because it can really drastically impact the way that we view the situation. The other thing that is really important to notice in this scene is that instead of acknowledging the complaints or frustrations that she's bringing up, he just matches or meets them with his own complaints. I got no money, a dress code problem, and a little murder case, which in the balance holds the lives of two innocent kids, not to mention your biological clock. Now, I do think he has a right to say this is not a good time, but for him to give his laundry list of his issues and not respond to anything she just said is basically saying my problems are more important than your problems. To him, it's really important to win this case. Of course, she's here to support him, but to her, their future is really important. And this case seems to be the only way she has any chance of getting what she wants, which is marriage. As a therapist, my next question to them would have been, now, is this what typically happens when you all talk about marriage? Because we wanna talk about what they're talking about and how they're talking about it. That's a really important aspect of paying attention to the pattern for a couple. They've been together for a really long time and he's been tying marriage to this impossible or imaginary goal. Ultimately, him winning that case has nothing to do with their marriage. It's a very arbitrary pairing that he's made. They're probably already living together. She's out here with him supporting him. There's not gonna be a ton of change in their relationship based on him winning a case. So I would ask him, what is the connection between winning this case and getting married to really get to the bottom of why he pairs the two together? Maybe it was a bad time to bring it up. You typically want to reserve arguments in the moment where there is not active tension and conflict. So a lot of times what we do is we get mad about something and then we try to argue in the moment. It's better to wait till things cool down in a good moment. Arguably, this could have been considered a good moment, but what he's saying is that his stress levels are so high that this is not a good time for them to have this conversation. But I don't think it was a terrible time for her to bring it up. This is a relatively quiet moment that it was okay to bring up something that could lead to big conflict. It just didn't go the way that she wanted it to go. And we never know. One thing I love about this clip is that neither of them is saying, you feel like this, you feel like that. She's saying, I feel my biological clock is ticking. I'm waiting, I can't be of help. And he's saying, I'm tired. I'm trying to win this case and things like that. So they're speaking from the I position and that's always a good sign of good conflict resolution. And if you watch this movie or even if you watch this clip, there's a lot of love in this relationship. They see a future for each other. They're just disagreeing about when that future is going to take place. She's already here with him, supporting him during this trial. So this is one of the couples I loved to watch because they are really, really good at showing each other that they love each other. Arguments absolutely can be constructive. We don't ever tell our couples that a healthy relationship is when you guys are no longer arguing. It's about being able to use that argument as an opportunity to learn more about your partner's perspective. Why treat your partner as like your opponent or enemy and try to one up them in an argument? You're a team, so whatever the issue is, you take that out of the relationship, it's called externalizing the problem. You argue about that thing and that thing alone. The only reason you're talking about it is so that you can figure out a solution that can work for both parties. Next up, 500 Days of Summer. Or just... What? But just what? Just... No, don't pull that with me. Don't even try to... This is not how you treat your friend. So this is something that I'm talking about with clients all the time, especially now with dating apps and so much access to people. It's really hard for people to define what counts as a relationship. And people are very hesitant to say, you're the only person that I'm going to be with. 
Kissing in the copy room, holding hands in Ikea, shower sex, come on, friends my balls. This movie was a bit ahead of its time, really depicting a situationship. A situationship is where you're pretty much reenacting everything or a lot of the things that you would expect to see in a committed relationship, such as meeting the person's family, maybe you guys even live together, holding hands in public, all of these things that you associate with the relationship, but there is no title. So you can't really call the person your girlfriend or boyfriend. I have clients, several clients, who have been in situationships for five plus years. And it's so hard because like he's saying, all of these things that are typically equated to being in a relationship with someone, now it's almost as if, as long as we don't have that title, anything goes. We can do these things, but I don't have a responsibility or obligation to you. I like you, Tom. I just don't want to relate. Well, you're not the only one that gets to say in this. I do too. And I say we're a couple. God damn it. The question that comes up here is, well, who gets to decide if it's a relationship? And really, that's the wrong question. The thing to pay attention to is, one of you wants a title and the other person does not want a title. You two do not want the same things. So again, we come to the question of values and sacrifice. So is it more important to you to continue making memories with this person, to build on your experiences, knowing that they don't want a relationship with you? Or is it more important to you to find somebody else that would be willing to call you their boyfriend or girlfriend, eventually husband or wife? There's no right answer. But what they are telling you is that you literally cannot have both. You cannot be with me and have a girlfriend. It's either or. When we think about those things, you always want to ask yourself, do we even want the same things? And if the answer is no, how much are you willing to sacrifice to be with this person? I typically don't see couples who come to me in this state because you're gonna have one person like, why would I come to couples therapy? We're not a couple. So what I end up seeing is one person and they're always talking to me about this relationship that they're in and how can we make it official? And they'll say to me like, don't you think we're in a relationship? What do you think about that? Sure, you're in a relationship, but if they're saying you guys aren't boyfriend and girlfriend, both people have to be in agreement about that title. If they don't accept the responsibilities and obligations of commitment that come with that title, then it's just a word. So what we really see here with Summer, it could be interpreted as she doesn't believe in the value of commitment. She doesn't think that's necessary for a fulfilling life, and that's a fair argument. Or we could look at it as a fear of commitment. And that's so prevalent today because people have so much more access through Instagram, through dating apps you're always questioning like, could there be something better, something more? And that puts people into the position of, do I really want to say that this is my one person? Do I really only want to date them? I think in today's day and age, we see this a lot more often than we even did in the past because everybody's terrified of missing out on something. Next up, The Sopranos. Oh, don't worry, I'm going to hell when I die. Nice thing to say to a person heading into an MRI. You know, Tony, I have always been sorry I said that. This is what happens sometimes when people say things and their feelings are hurt, but it's not talked about in the moment. Here it is coming up randomly out of nowhere and she feels remorseful. You know, the best thing you can do when you say and do something that hurt your partner and they finally bring it up is to apologize. Now let's see how he responds to her. Carmel, who the f did you think I was when you married me, huh? You knew my father. You grew up around Dickie Moltisanti and your Uncle Eddie. Where, where do you get off acting all surprised when there are women on the side? 
when I say I'm a marriage and family therapist, the reason those two go hand in hand is because when we get married or we form a relationship, often we're trying to create our own family and often it's in response to the family that we grew up in. So you normally see one of two extremes. Either you had a very loving home or a home that you loved and you're trying to imitate it and have an identical setup, which puts a lot of pressure on the relationship, or you hated the environment you were brought up in and you're trying to create the exact opposite. And what we're seeing here is he's telling her, like, you know our community, you know our family, you knew what the expectations are. I do what I want, I live the lifestyle I want, I cheat, but I provide you with nice things. That's the arrangement. He's basically telling her like, don't act surprised. You know we're just playing out what we've seen generation after generation. Of course, when we say that these are the expectations, that doesn't mean that those expectations are really what's going to make us happy or fulfill us. She seems a little bit upset, you know, and frustrated. She absolutely is entitled to her feelings, but I think he feels justified in the lifestyle they've been living because he feels like she's trying to now say it's not enough when it's been enough for all of these other women that they've grown up witnessing. So I honestly think that he's entitled to his as well, just given what they grew up with. Every couple has to decide what works well for them. You have some couples who are in an open marriage where being sexually monogamous is not the most important thing to them. And as long as they're on the same page about that, that's fine. You have couples where they have an arrangement of we're getting married for a green card and I just need companionship. Every marriage is not going to look the same. There's no right or wrong way to be married. The right way is just for you two to be on the same page. I have been dreaming and fantasizing and in love with Furio. Let's pause here. I just want to quickly compare this scene to the scene in a marriage story where we see him punch a wall. This was very different, right? She's right by his fist and he's trying to intimidate her and punish her for saying those words. That leans a little closer to emotional and mental abuse. I could converse with her because she had something to say. I am here. I have things to say. Besides bring the chairs down and did you sign the living trust? She's a grown a woman who's been kicked around. Unlike me, is that it? This couple is showing so much contempt and criticism to each other. I don't know how much love is left. If there is love in the relationship, I don't think it's mutual. When it comes to when to divorce, is it okay to divorce? That is such a subjective conversation and a lot of times, our family plays a big part in that decision. Our religion plays a big part in that decision. Cause some people are gonna say never divorce and other people are gonna say you can divorce if somebody cheats or if somebody hits you. What I will say is in a case like this, they both have invested several years, decades into this marriage. And I would say if you've been unhappy for a majority of that time, we only get one life, so you want to really think about the data that you've accumulated through these experiences and see, do you think it's worth it? Is it more important to you to have that prestige within your community of being married for a long time? Or is it more important for you to live and try a new life on your own? There is no right answer. It's totally based on your own values. Thank you for watching these clips with me about scenes with couples arguing. I hope that you learned something new about how to deal with conflict, maybe even in your own relationships. See you later.